So the message is titled God Over Government, and the thesis that I want you to consider as we make our way through these passages is this. It is possible, yes, it is possible to be governed by God in the midst of an ungodly government. Some qualifying statements before we jump into Romans 13. Being governed by God does not equal thoughtless submission to every institution. So many people have been led to believe this because of what I call faulty exegesis. The scriptures absolutely command the believer to obey what God has appointed unless what God has appointed becomes corrupted. When a government is absent of God, their governance will eventually be an affront to God. Let me say that again. When a government is absent of God, their governance will eventually be an affront to God. And more than that is this. When you remove God from government, any nation, any institution opens themselves up to divine judgment. And here's why. Godless governments think they are God. And thus, they become the puppet of the great tyrant. That's Lucifer, the devil, the accuser, Satan. Since the inception of the church of Jesus Christ, the government has been its most ruthless persecutor, merciless antagonist. It is a governmental affair to persecute the people of God. When you look at history, you see from the terror of the Roman Empire to the monstrous monarchs of the Middle Ages, to the diabolical dictators like Mao, Stalin, Lenin, Hitler, Hussein, Obama, Biden. Oh, my note said Osama bin Laden, my bad. You see, such dictators are always the long arm of Lucifer. Now consider this, if the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one, that's 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The world is the cosmos, it's the system of evil, and the system of evil is made up of sinners. If the whole world is lulled to sleep under the wicked one, then he, of course, will use a certain institution to accomplish his agenda. Jesus called Satan the God of this world. He said it in John chapter 12, verse 31. He reiterated it in John 14. And again, he said it in John 16. Paul would pen that he's the God of this age. 2 Corinthians 4, 4. He blinds the minds of those from seeing and hearing the gospel. He's the prince of the power of the air. I consider the airwaves. He controls the Marxist mainstream media. So if that's all true, then what stream do you think would be most useful for the enemy to accomplish his agenda, which is lethal and harmful? Which stream? You know, people err greatly today when they say politics don't belong in the pulpit. Because to say that is to say God doesn't belong in government. And we are currently witnessing a nation that has completely removed God from its governance. And as we just prayed, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and government apart from God becomes God. And that is why they seek to remove God-given rights. It wasn't the Constitution's idea to have life and liberty. That was Christ's idea to give us life and liberty. So in the American context, these antichrist rulers use our freedom to destroy our freedom. That's their strategy. Their desire is to de-Christianize our society. For example, holding to biology that there are two genders, male and female, is now considered bigotry. And because the Bible is accused of being outdated, it makes it easier for immorality to be legislated. But if you're paying attention, you will see that being politically correct is often morally corrupt. Human rights might be the banner of the various movements, but human rights are wrong when they contradict what God says is right for humans. It's been a slow fade that has increased rapidly these days. From the spirit of relativism to the glamorization of socialism, ours is a backwards land that puts the sin in paganism. Yes, our constitution is under attack, 
But that is not the only reason we should be pushing back. You see, our faith is not determined by the Bill of Rights. Our faith is determined by what the Bible says is right. And because I know Bible, it's in Christ that I am free to speak truth. And I'm truthfully free. And that's how you rhyme. Tell that to Pastor Gary. <laughs> See, those who are governed by the one true God will not submit to godless governments. And no, Romans 13 is not a command to submit to any form of government. Again, many have been led to believe this because of faulty exegesis. Romans 13, misapplied, creates the stream for a tyrant to rise. Romans 13 was the most taught out of scripture in the 30s. As the Nazi movement was brewing, as Hitler was rising to a position of power, he was literally protected by the churches that were preaching Romans 13 for the people to comply and to get in line. So let's look at Romans 13 and see what the Lord has for us. It says this in Romans 13 verses one through five, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists the ordinance of God and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Okay, let's look at some phrases here. Notice it says from God. God, by God, of God. And I add a parenthetical note, which is worth considering. The writer of Romans was the Apostle Paul, who found himself in violation against the government more than any other individual in the New Testament. And by the way, the very government that he was in violation of eventually wielded the sword that would kill the Apostle Paul, but he was unwilling to compromise his convictions that were built upon the gospel. Now some qualifiers, Romans 13 verse 3, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Now you have God defining evil and good. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good. Again, who defines good? God defines good and what is good. And you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, now again, God defines evil. Be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Notice the qualifier. The individual who practices evil. This is how God uses the ministers of his justice. Verse five, therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. When your conscience is held captive by the scriptures, you then have an idea of how God defines good and evil. And this entire account completely breaks down when the governing authority contradicts the divine design of government. Let me say it like this, a governing authority forfeits their divine appointment when their policies contradict the divine design of government. Did you notice how many times it mentioned good and evil in that passage? In other words, government's design is to sustain good and restrain evil. When you begin to see governments or institutions doing the opposite, not restraining evil, but honoring evil, not sustaining good, but punishing good, you see something inversed that absolutely welcomes a curse. See, the Bible is always complementing itself. It doesn't contradict, nowhere. Isaiah chapter five, verse 20 tells us what God calls a woe. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who call a man a woman and a woman a man. Woe to those who call what is harmful safe and what is safe harmful. Woe to those who call what is unjust just and what is just unjust. Are you understanding this? Proverbs 16, 12 says, it is an abomination for a king to commit wickedness. Why? Because the king sat on a throne. The, th the throne represented authority. It represented an order. And it was an abomination because a king or a president or a ruler 
impacted people. So the ripple effects of when a government is inversed or upside down will inevitably throw off the stabilization of a society, beginning with the redefinition of marriage, beginning with redefining morality, beginning with how we want to put a relative spin on gender and sexuality. All of this is the complete opposite of the divine design and what God says is good and what God says is evil. So here's the question. Should a believer in Christ submit to something that God calls a woe? I'll help you. It rhymes with woe. (laughs) Pastor Gary might not, not be doing so bad with his rhymes around here. See, we're called to be obedient to truth not compliant to lies. And of course, that word compliant, compliance, today, how it's used. So I would say be cautious of anyone who defines loving your neighbor by blindly following whatever a godless government demands or mandates. Be cautious of anybody (laughs) that would use the mantra of loving your neighbor without introducing them to the Savior. Be careful. See, here's why. As Christians, we don't love people by giving credibility to fear or lies. You don't love by solidifying fear. We don't bow down because everybody's doing it, nor do we cease living out our faith because it's forbidden in the public space. Again, the lie of separation of church and state, which again, many pulpits, many churches, they believe the lie that the church and the state should be separated. But when you look at it, separation of church and state always leads to submission of church to state. So I want to pause, pivot, and make my way into the book of Daniel for many reasons. One, I'm in the book of Daniel at my home church. The themes are on the forefront of my heart and mind. Two, as I'm coming to the conclusion of that book, I saw two central themes moving in the same direction simultaneously. And again, it was in the thesis I presented up front. It is possible to be governed by God in the midst of an ungodly government. It's possible like Daniel and his three Hebrew friends, who we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, It's possible to maintain your conviction, to not conform to the culture around you in the midst of a culture of paganism and pluralism and progressivism, in the midst of a spirit of relativism. It's possible to stand firm for your faith. And the secondary theme at the end of chapter two, chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine, and chapter 11 in Daniel, you get prophecy. And notice the prophecies are always about world governments. And God, of course, is warning his people, the Jews, about the rising and falling of world empires, all of which eventually bleed and lead to the final form of a godless government, known as the government that will be spearheaded by the Antichrist. So I stop and say, how do we go from where we're at today to the eventual rise of this kingdom that will be led by the Antichrist. Are we seeing signs and symptoms of the time? Yeah, we are. So what's the ideology that a godless government abides by to accomplish their agenda? Interestingly, in one verse, smack dab in the middle of Daniel, you see it, Daniel 6, 5. Here's their ideology. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now, now I, I, I've taught Daniel 6. You have been a recipient of the book of Daniel at the end of 2019 is when Pastor Gary was teaching it. You all know the end result of Daniel 6. It's Daniel in the lion's den. But did you ever notice how this one verse becomes the ideology that every godless government eventually utilizes? What do you mean by that? Let's just change a few words here. We shall not find any charge against the church, against the Christian, unless we find it against them concerning the law of their God. This becomes the chief aim of the enemy, to have laws and policies that contradict 
the scriptures, to have moral values that are accepted by the majority that are all antithetical to the Bible. The enemy knows the Christian is eventually going to have to choose legislation like the Equality Act, currently on the back burner in the House or the Senate, excuse me, is not about equality. When you read it, and if you haven't, you should, it's basically making the Christian the enemy. It goes against everything that we would hold as absolute truth. Now, how do you get to a place in a nation that was founded on biblical principles to where it seems as if God has been removed from every single pillar? Well, I just told you the ideology. What's the strategy? How did they accomplish this? We see it in Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1 is a microcosm. They, of course, are deploying their indoctrination on a demographic of youth, Hebrew boys. But if you notice what they accomplished with them, you can actually take that microcosm and apply it generally to how the enemy deploys his agenda. He utilizes the weapons of mass indoctrination, and there are several tentacles to this totalitarian tactic. The first thing you must do is contradict truth. Go against all that is absolute. If you can contradict truth and you can completely remove biblical standards, the reading of the Bible from schools, no longer praying to God publicly, if you can contradict truth in the words of Hitler, the state would have to be scrubbed clean of Christian convictions and values. Why? Because they are like mirrors that remind humans of a higher authority, of a divine standard. I was at the Museum of the Bible yesterday with my family, and I of course know that throughout your capital, the capital of our country, they have Bible references written on various monuments and buildings. It is an example of how the foundation of a nation was founded on Scripture. So the enemy knows he must remove these, these resemblances. If he can contradict truth, make relativism the law of the land, the very next thing he can do is control the news. Contradict truth, control the news. Joseph Goebbels, minister of propaganda for Hitler, said this, and I bet you heard the first part. If you tell a lie big enough, and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. You ever heard that? Listen to the rest of the quote. The lie can be maintained only for such time as the state can shield the people from the political, economic, and military consequences of the lie. It thus becomes vitally important for the state to use all of its powers to repress dissent, for the truth is the mortal enemy of the lie, and thus by extension, the truth is the greatest enemy of the state. Six media giants currently control 90% of what you read, watch, and listen to. 90%. A conglomerate of billionaires who, by the way, when you look them all up, none of them have a biblical worldview. And I would caution anyone to step back and be very wary of any source that does not have a biblical world view. If you can contradict truth and you can control the news, the inevitable, you will conflict groups. You will bring conflict to groups. It has been coined cultural Marxism. It's a class war. And as long as you can get people in a society to be at each other's throats, whether it's the rich versus the poor, whether it's the blacks versus the whites, you will see a destabilization to that society. And then the government swoops in and often brings a solution. As you give up your rights, we will, we will help you. It's for your good. Did you know the Nazi propaganda machine leveraged man-made epidemics to justify quarantining the Jews and thus gave rise to the derogatory name of a filthy Jew. 
This is where that came from. The media was able to convince the people that the Jews were unclean. So they were justified in putting them in colonies, quarantined. And then the people were so manipulated that when they would see Jews, they automatically made the association that they're carrying a disease, that they're contagious. Hello? (laughs) We are currently in the midst of a psychological civil war in our land. And the believer knows it's spiritual, so it's greater than the vax versus the unvaxed. By the way, last year's heroes on the front line are today's villains and they're being sidelined. And the church of Jesus Christ should be supporting those who are in those vulnerable positions. Every industry is under attack by these godless mandates. If you can contradict truth and you can control the news and you can bring conflict to groups, you can convert the youth. Do I need to add any more color commentary to that final pillar of converting the youth? The agendas and curriculum that is reaching our children at an earlier age than ever before. Why? Because the enemy knows the mind of a child is pliable. And that is why it's the parents' right and responsibility to make sure. <laughs> it's social conditioning, and social conditioning leads to spiritual conforming. Conditioning is the psychological process of training individuals in a society to act in a way that's broadly approved and, of course, is accepted by various peer groups. So people are sheeple who blindly accept what's lethal when not shepherded by the Bible. Do I need to say that again? (laughs) See, how fortunate for governments that the people they administer don't think. You know who said that? Adolf Hitler said that. When I posted it on my Facebook recently, I was instantly introduced to Facebook jail. (laughs) Because God forbid that we would want people to see into the mind of a maniac who was responsible for killing six million Jews. Did you ever wonder how they tamed a lion? Back in the day, a man who sought to tame this very strong creature, he would actually stand outside the cage and he wouldn't move. He would actually be patient and he would condition the creature, the lion, to be comfortable with his presence. Over time, he took the step a little bit further. He would step into the cage, but there'd be a partition that separated him from the lion. And he would do the same thing. He would stay there. He would not provoke the animal, but he would allow the animal to be comfortable with his presence. And then he would remove the partition and get closer. Over time, when you would remove the cage entirely, the beast, the lion, was completely okay with the presence of a man. And what I'm saying is, the Bible tells us the righteous are as bold as a lion. So riddle me this. Why are lions complying with those who are lying? It's because we've been conditioned to be comfortable around the presence of sin, around the presence of immorality, around the presence of tyranny. We've been told, stay in your Christian bubble. Let the state dictate the civil affairs of society. You worry about spiritual matter, but anybody that knows Bible knows that spiritual matter influences every sphere of life. And we are called to stand on truth. This is how they did it. In Daniel's day, Daniel 3, verses 4 to 6, then a herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that's everybody, a herald is the messenger of the kingdom or the messenger of the king, aka the media 
that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that the king has established and set up, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the burning, fiery furnace. Okay, translation, when you hear the music of the media, don't question it. When you hear the music of the mandates, comply. When you hear the music of medical misinformation, don't look into it. Bow down, because everybody else is doing it. The same exact thing occurred in Daniel 6. Daniel 6, 6 and 7. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, or Darius, if you want to pronounce it incorrectly, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute, an executive order, a mandate to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any God or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, I don't want to take these two accounts too far, but I can reduce them to this one statement. Fall in line with the ordinance or suffer the consequence. And that is why it's a sad state in the church when pilots, not pulpits, are leading the charge. See, pastors... Pastors in pulpits who are in agreement with godless pundits are nothing but parrots and puppets to the prince of the power of the air. Say that five times fast and leave that type of church just as fast. <laughs> you guys are blessed to have a pastor in a pulpit who is unwilling to compromise the truth of Scripture. Pastor Gary believes in the authority of the Bible over all of life, and he understands the power of we the people in Christ. And you don't avoid or ignore the elephant in the room when a lion lives inside of you. You don't do that. You address it from a biblical worldview. You speak the gospel unadulterated. You remain gospel regulated. And yes, this will mark you and you will be persecuted. That's what the Bible says. It says it in first, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. All those who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Back to Daniel chapter 3 and Daniel chapter 6. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Remember, Daniel chapter 1, that microcosm, they sought to teach them the language and literature of the who? The Chaldeans those that were connected to the worldly system. Now, notice who's coming and making the accusation. The Chaldeans, those that don't agree with the Bible. And they come forth in verse 12 and say, certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Same exact thing happens in Daniel 6. The reason I love these two accounts, they've been taught a lot in the church. What's the application for today? Daniel 3, you get teenagers saying, I'm unwilling to compromise my faith. So I say to the young ones in here, no matter the peer pressure around you, know who you are in Christ and be willing to stand alone with Jesus even if everybody is sitting down in a crowd without him. And Daniel 6, of course, is a man who's in his 80s. So you go from seniors in high school to senior citizens. And God is saying, I still have more for you to accomplish. So they accuse Daniel of the same, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show due regard for you, O king, for the decree that you have signed, but makes petition three times a day. Okay, what did Daniel do? Let's go back a few verses and we get a sneak peek into his response. Look at me. Which was redemptive, not reactive. Verse 10. Now when the writing was signed and Daniel knew it, he went home. And in his upper room, with his windows open towards Jerusalem, 
he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. The most important phrase in that verse, as was his custom since early days. This is a man who had a higher regard for his king. He wasn't disregarding the king. He just had a higher regard for his king. This is a man who's not in defiance. He's actually in obedience. Civil disobedience at times is biblical obedience, as was his custom, as was his habit, as was his constant and consistent conviction, unwilling to stop what he had always done. So when the government says stop meeting, when the government says stop preaching, when the government says stop praying, when the government says don't bring up that name, the disciples said we obey God rather than men. I remember being four years into my incarceration, I had done a Bible study every day for that amount of time, one hour a day with a group of my peers. On one unit, up to 30 men out of 38 on a housing unit would gather around the word of God. And I would be able to communicate it and teach it as God would have me in that moment. One day before study, which was at the same time every day, which many of the officers approved of, affirmed, and saw the impact that Christians were having on a godless environment. One day as we prayed, holding hands on our housing unit, we were blocking away where the guards would walk through. So if we're all seated, they could walk through without any hindrance. So we're all holding hands, so we're blocking the one walkway. But we've never not blocked the walkway while praying. While praying, I overhear an officer, female voice, so I knew it was an officer, yelling at the top of her lungs, cursing, move out of the way. So I open my one eye, I see a lieutenant standing outside of our prayer circle, waiting to get through. Now we weren't, we weren't praying for like long at all. I remember looking at the young man who was praying, he was next to me, I squeezed his hand and I said, finish praying. He prayed for another three to five seconds, said amen, we sat down. The lieutenant walked through, the other guard followed, and they do their routine check. They check the fire escape, and they document it every day, same time. As they walked back past the group, I started to study. They said, Mayor, to the sally port. I walk out into the sally port, I put my hands behind my back, and they began to reprimand me. They were this close from my face telling me, who do I think I am to show such disrespect to the officer? Now, you might be saying, well, they told you to get out of the way. You continue to pray. And I said, no, you don't get it. You see, every single day, multiple times a day, the Muslims would pray at the exit, fire exit, and they would block the fire exit. And the guards would come on and they dare not interrupt the Muslims from praying. In fact, they wouldn't even do their check. They would walk off the housing unit and who knows, probably document the fact that they did their check. So on this day, because we were praying and we were believers in the one true God, you better believe it was way more than just breaking a policy of blocking a fire exit. It was spiritual. Now, long story short, they eventually moved me from that housing unit. Consequentially, to make a point. And they moved me downstairs. And I ended up downstairs. And on the very next day, a memorandum went out throughout the entire prison saying, you are no longer allowed to congregate at the tables, which is where I ran the Bible studies, or it will be considered inciting a riot. So I went to the table and started a Bible study. As was my custom since early days. I also landed back on the same housing unit where my entire incarceration began. Four years later, God was giving me a picture of how far he had taken me. That same housing unit looked different. Four years into my faith journey, God had done a work in my heart that is hard to describe. He had developed my conviction. I would be exiting prison in the next few months from this point, from that housing unit. I would be exiting prison as a convict for life. But greater than that was the conviction that God gave me in his son, Jesus Christ, 
So in spite of the government of a jailhouse or the godless government of the White House, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Lord. Type of faith does the Bible mandate? Daniel chapter three, verse 16 to 18 tells us there are consequences, young men, for not bowing down. In fact, the king said, if you bow down now, you will be relieved of the consequence. To which they said, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set. Did you see their faith? We believe in a God who can deliver and can provide and can save, and we believe he will, and I'm gonna hold on to that promise. But even if he doesn't, even if he chooses to allow me to go into the burning fiery furnace or enter into the situation that's gonna have very real consequence, even if he allows it, I still won't bow down and I will still only submit to the one true king. That is the faith the Bible mandates. Believer, we trust the Lord with our circumstances and then we rest knowing he controls the consequences. We do what we can and we trust that he will do what we can't. You see, they both... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, they both ended up receiving the consequence of their stance. They ended up in the burning fiery furnace. We know that. Daniel ended up in the lion's den. We know that. Both, however, give us an example. And the example is that the Lord enters in with us. See, sometimes the favor of God will keep you from getting fired. Sometimes the favor of God will lead you into the fire. Why? Because the fire is not just for you. Yes, it's refining. God is always making us more like Jesus who learned the things of obedience through suffering. But it's also for those who are watching us. It's for a world that is watching how we will respond. You see, in the midst of the burning fiery furnace, the king said, wait a second, I thought we threw in three. How come I see Four, and the fourth is like a son of the gods. And we believe that this was a pre-incarnate Christ, that Christ himself entered into the fiery furnace with them. And I love it because where do Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get to see Christ most clearly and experience him most dearly? Not before the furnace, but in the furnace. Where does Daniel get to see the angel of the Lord, which I believe is a pre-incarnate Jesus? It's in the lion's den. And the point is, there are people watching us and how we, I call it, suffer successfully, that we're going to do what is righteous regardless of the consequence, because people need to see that what you believe, you believe. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one of the voices that was sounding the alarm in Nazi Germany in total opposition of what was happening. Many couldn't see it. The same government that he was in violation of was the same government that would eventually execute him. There's a testimony from a doctor who was watching. He wrote this. Through the half open door in one room of the huts, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer before taking off his prison garb. He knelt down on the floor and began praying fervently to his God. I was deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout, so certain that his God heard him. At the place of the execution, he again said a short prayer, climbed the steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued after a few seconds. In the almost 50 years that I worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. See the courage and composure that comes to a posture is because you know the God who controls your future. Billy Graham said, courage is contagious. When a man takes a stand, 
the spines of others are stiffened. So whether it's teachers like Tanner Cross standing up, parents across this country rising up, pastors in pulpits speaking up, now is the time to wake up because if we don't wake up to it, we will not wake up from it. Now is not the time to be cowardice or silenced. Now is the time to be courageous. In the words of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. And if you keep reading in Romans 13, you will run into verse 11. And do this, knowing the time, that now is the high time to awake out of sleep. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So church, choose God over government. Because Christ is truly risen, we have been commissioned to hold the line of truth on this side of heaven. And those that know their calling will not fall prey to the lies of Babylon because you know one day Babylon will be fallen. Our God is in control for the dawning of tomorrow to the falling of a sparrow. Every king and every kingdom and every godless government will eventually be overthrown except for those who are governed by God and submit to the one true throne. His name is Jesus Christ. So I will end by saying this. It is absolutely better to stand alone and stand out for Jesus Christ than to sit down and bow down in a crowd without him. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this assembly here and the opportunity to address them with your word. I pray they were encouraged that we as your body would take a stand for righteousness, that we would be the lights in our dark world. We would be the salts that bring influence and change souls. We know the gospel is the only power that can salvage the soul. And Lord, we know you control the outcome of elections, but we commit it to you. We do our part and we rest and know that you are in complete control. Use this body in the name of Jesus. Amen.